Good afternoon, Pastor David. How you doing, John? I'm doing well, thank you. Welcome everybody to Unfiltered, a random moment with Pastor David. And as you guys know, as on Tuesdays, we talk more about current events that are going on in our nation or worldwide. And on Thursdays, we like to tease out your message for Sundays. And so today, as we look at some of the headlines or some of the things that are going on around us, I wanted to ask you a question and get your feedback on this See this the sense that our government or our leadership is committed to chaos. And uh, and so I wanted to ask, has our failing leadership weakened America on the international stage? You know, I, I don't know that the government per se, you know, beginning we'll say with the with the president, you know, the executive branch with the president and all. I don't know that that he could actually be committed towards chaos. I don't know that he is. I, I frankly wouldn't judge his heart in such a way. But is the path he's taking creating chaos? I'd say absolutely. Because instead of being a unifier, he has become a, a divider. He campaigned under the, the um, what would it be? It wasn't really a slogan so much, but under the the um, belief that he was going to unify the nation that that Trump had, he had thought, divided. So he he basically tried to unify people by saying that he was going to counter the things that created the problems, etc. And we all know that. I'm just saying that, which people already know. So I wouldn't think that he, with intent, is causing chaos. I would say the fruit of what he does is chaotic. And that's because instead of uniting us, he has taken positions that even constituents, those of the Democratic Party, and even those who classify themselves as independent, um, are incapable of actually following or agreeing with. So he has, by taking the, the more liberal um, positions that his, his party Holds. He, he has successfully on his own created that kind of confusion which always will lead to chaos. And so under his inability, I would say, to, to, to compromise, under his incapacity to see somebody else's position, um, he's created what I would say is the, the dissatisfaction uh, of, of the general American. I mean, poll after poll points out that people don't trust his leadership. They don't trust his his ability to make decisions. They don't they don't agree with uh, his vice president and her positions and all. And so, yeah, the great uniter has become the great divider. Well, you know, as we had tried this once before, <clears throat> and uh, we were speaking of of the disconnect. With the American people, in, in some of the ways, in such of the ways as gas prices or yeah. going to the store, and and how how does, as an American, do we view that as a president who's saying I'm doing the best for the country? You know, we see our vice president even in a podium, she's asked a question and she has to refer it to a foreign leader, and I I just see this disconnect between the people of the United States and our and the administration. Well, there is an absolute disconnect, John. Um, President Biden doesn't have to worry about the cost of gas. And even if you were not the president, having other people fill up vehicles that he doesn't own, even if he was filling his own vehicle, one, he probably wouldn't be the one who was putting gas into his own car. Uh, he's a multi, multi-millionaire, m millions that he has made uh, in political office over 40 plus years. When One wonders how you can be so rich, have so many homes when you're supposed to be a public servant, but that's, I guess, for another broadcast, <laughs> right? But he wouldn't understand. He wouldn't understand the cost of gas because it doesn't affect him. We, the taxpayer, are paying to fill up his tank. Uh, he wouldn't understand waiting in line at a grocery store because he doesn't have to do that. The only time he's ever in line is when he's getting ice cream, and that's usually for a, a photo op. The same is true with... Uh, the vice president, and that goes on both sides of the aisle. I mean, Republican 
presidents wouldn't know that any more than a Democrat. I mean, that's just the political life, right? And so you just can't tell me that you're a scrappy guy from Scranton and understand because you don't. You don't pay for your own meals. You don't pay for the upkeep of the house you're living in. We do. You don't pay for your own gas. You don't pay for your own medical costs. You don't pay for anything. It's all paid for you. Plus, you're taking the president's salary every year. You could live very well on, even if we, you weren't the president. If you were making $400,000 a year, you can live very comfortably. You can do that, obviously. So when he tries to say, when any political official like that, a president, I don't care, again, if it's Republican or not, when they say, I feel your pain, that may be a nice thing to say politically, but that's just not true practically. See, so people my age, people who have lived for some time and have seen many presidents come and go, I, I don't listen to their rhetoric. I don't listen to their supposed compassion. They don't pay medical costs. They don't have to wait in line to, to finally see a doctor. They have a private doctor. They don't live in our world, John. And that's why I think the, um, the only thing that matters with these people is whether or not they're leading according to the will of the people. And this, this president is not. This president doesn't believe, apparently doesn't believe, in the greatness of the United States. Our vice president is, is an apologist for other countries. She doesn't, she doesn't have a grasp of what's going on either. That poor, I feel sorry for her in many ways because she hasn't the capacity to actually answer the questions that are asked of her. And it's not because she's not intelligent and it's not because she hasn't been disciplined. She received her, her law degree. This is a, an educated woman who is, who is in the midst of, of, of the leaders, the world shakers. She just, she's not up for the task and neither is he. I don't think he ever has been up for the task. And so we're only reaping what the political uh, voters uh, sowed. That's what we're reaping right now. We've got supply chain problems. We've got border problems. We've, we are paying Russia, have been, had been paying Russia for oil. And I thought Russia was our great enemy. I thought, I thought this was the conspiracy. How are we... How do we do that? Give them a billion dollars basically a day. How do you do that when you've been telling us that, that they are such enemies and they're, uh, they're colluding with Trump and this and that? I don't know why people don't see it, but they, they're, they're just spiritually blind, John, because this is what they voted for. And uh, a great number of people are kind of awakening to it because the polls seem to point that over 70% of Americans are disagreeing with the direction of, that this country is going in. Well, you know, it's it's uh, it's crazy to even see that uh, our administration reaching out to the Middle East for for makes no sense for fuel when we had so it just all these things and 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 you know and I think Pastor that sometimes even as as Christians we hopefully that this is a wake up call for us to to vote our conscience. And Problem is, John, millions of Christians don't vote here in California. We we we're good at complaining. But when it comes to casting our vote, millions do not vote. And that's, that's the, the problem. Millions of, of, of those who call on the name of Jesus as their Savior don't even take their time to do that. So we end up with a government that was voted in by those who are willing to, to, to cast a vote. That's where our problem is. There's too many, too many polls that have been taken that, that show that evangelical Christians are not even voting. So, again, they have no right to complain about the government. None at all. They allowed that government to be voted in, you know. And so you reap what you sow. Yes. That's how it works. You know, Pastor, in, in, in your experience and throughout your lifetime, have you ever seen anything like you see now with our administration? I've never seen such an incompetent and inept administration. Again, I'm no political pundit. What do I know about politics? But in a long life... and and seeing uh, presidents all the way from Eisenhower to Biden, I can say I have never seen anything as bad as what we have today when it comes to leadership, never. Uh, a man who stumbles over the most simple statements, a man who apparently lives in the past wanting us to know how tough he was when he was a young man. This is a man 80 years old. 
I don't want to hear about this frail, fragile man's fighting prowess. I don't want to hear it. I, I would like to see some dignity. I would like to see some wisdom. I don't see that with this man, and I certainly don't see it with the vice president. There's absolutely none of that in these people. And then when you begin to look at the the um, the others that are with the loudest voices, the the Ocasio Cortezes and and their posse, it it is ridiculous. And and I could go on about that. I won't. But I will say that we really are in a world of of hurts, and the church needs to wake up. And we certainly need to be praying for uh, our, our leaders more fervently than we ever have. And because uh, as uh, Jesus tells us in Matthew 24, deception is gonna be the greatest sign of, of his return. It's not gonna be the wars, rumors of wars. Mm -hmm. uh, and we start to see it, you know, we talked about this before as uh, the Dracula that came to your uh, your parents' house as a little kid because your dad had the best candy, right? Yeah, a little boy came over and my mom uh, gave him the candy that my dad brought home because my dad was a truck driver, so they would give him a box of candy, and they were they were not the inexpensive ones. During that time, they were Mounds bars and Almond Joyce, and they were nice. You know, they weren't penny candy. They were the candy that cost a little bit more. And yeah, a little boy came over, and he was dressed like Dracula, and he knocked on the door three different times. Um, the first time, he looked regular. The second time, he was hiding his face with his cape. The third time, he was holding his hands up like they were claws. And my mother was busting up over this kid because he thought that if he tried to make himself look different, that my mom would be fooled. And I see that as being kind of like what we see in politics today, people who are pretending that there's something they're not in order to get the treat that they desire, no doubt. Yes, and the exciting thing is about this, if there's a silver lining, and there is a silver lining, that we are to keep our eyes on Christ. Well, the bottom line is, is if you don't, you're going to just be in despair. We have to keep our eyes on Jesus. He is our blessed hope. And, uh, you know, that's why we say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. But until then, we're going to occupy until he comes. Right. So we don't have a president, we have a king. Well, we will always have a king. We will always have a savior. We always will have that one whom we trust and look to. But until that day, we do, we do the best that we can to elect the officials that would represent us. And I, I don't believe in giving up. I don't believe in not having something to do with, with uh, in this fight. So if a Christian wants to be a, a board member for a school, if he, he or she wants to run for mayor or senator or whatever governor, uh, if that's a call they have in their life, I fully support that and encourage them to do that. Amen. Pastor, thank you so much for uh, your time and sharing uh, your thoughts on this. I do want to invite us, invite church family to our Wednesday evening service uh, as pastor you're taking us through Ephesians chapter 4. Chapter 4 verses 1 through 6. We're going to look at the walk that is worthy. Mm. And then communion. Communion. So church family, it's a great opportunity to invite your friends to come join us to be in God's word to worship and to celebrate communion Amen. together. So thank you pastor. Thank you guys for tuning in. God bless you. We'll see you soon.